Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. 2020 is the 10th anniversary of the Long Box Review podcast, and to celebrate this milestone, I have chosen 10 episodes to spotlight. These episodes have some importance to me, or I just like them a lot. I hope you enjoy these retrosodes as much as I did making them. Thank you for your support over these 10 years. For this fifth retrosode, I decided to rebroadcast one of my favorite conversations. Uh, This is episode 88, where Damien, uh, a.k.a. Sleepy Reader 666 and I jumped on YouTube and had a several-hour discussion about the comic Danger Club. Uh, This was by Landry Q. Walker, Eric Jones, and Rusty Drake, and it is one of my very favorite comic books in recent memory, if not of all time. Anyway, this discussion spanned episodes 88 through 91 uh, and was broadcast originally in October, November, over a month period in 2015. Damien and I covered all nine issues, uh, that is issues one through eight of the series, and an extra issue eight, which was an alternate ending for the series that you could only get by buying the single copies. And uh, not only did I buy that, of course, uh, to talk about it, uh, and like I said, it's one of my very favorite comics because I I have uh, double issues of all the singles. I have two trades. I have them digitally, <laughs> twice digitally. <laughs> anyway, I love this comic. Part of the reason I, I chose this this uh, for the 10th anniversary retrosode uh, was that I really, uh, Demi and I really dove deep into the comic. And finally, just to note, after uh, those episodes aired, I got some feedback from Landry Q. Walker himself on Twitter. And that was just a delight to get that. And so he revealed some things uh, about the series that uh, we had missed or confirmed some things that we had dis- we had questions about or talked about. Anyway, here is part one of uh, that conversation with Damien, and if you are interested, you can listen to the rest of the episodes. I'll have links in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. I have a very special uh, show here today. Uh, uh, My friend from the interwebs, Damien, will be joining us to talk about one of my favorite, very favorite comics from the last couple of years, Danger Club. So Damien, welcome. Thanks for having me. My first time on a podcast. <laughs> Glad to have you. Uh, I've done about 350 videos on my channel, Sleepy Reader 666, if anyone wants to check that out. And they should. So Damien, tell us a little bit about yourself since you are a first time uh, uh, co-host on, on my podcast. Tell us a little bit about your, um, about your channel and just, uh, just real quick in general, your interests in, uh, comic books. Well, I'm a very long time comic book reader and, uh, I do a, what is essentially a comic book reading vlog on, on my, um, on my channel, basically talk about what I've been reading lately or any other kind of thoughts that pop into my head. Um, and it's part of this online community of people who like to chat about comic books. So, and, and I guess I come, you know, I started reading comics in the early bronze age and I'm still reading them. I still like to read the new stuff and the old stuff. Yeah, we have, uh, I think we have a lot of similar tastes, tastes, uh, at the very least, we have a similar time frame in which we began reading. Cause I, I came in, uh, into comics in the late bronze age, very late bronze age. And, uh, have a very, uh, I have a big fondness for that time period and into the, the, the next age of comics as well. Cause that's really when I, when I, uh, got into a lot of different things. Right. I think we do have a lot of similar tastes um, from what I've seen on Twitter and listening to your podcast and comments we've made back and forth to each other. And uh, I think I'm maybe a half a step ahead of you. I probably started heavily reading comics around 73, 74. Oh, yeah, definitely then, because I came in in late 78, I think it was. So you have a few years on me then. 
Right. And then I spent a few years being too old and mature to read comics. And then I really <laughs> came back to them in a big way in about 79 as I got older and less mature, I guess. <laughs> well, hey, you came in at a great time because 79, 80 and, and, you know, getting into those yeah, early 80s. I, I love that period. And I think that's, even though we probably read them at a different age, we both kind of have a strong feeling for how great that period was. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, uh, some of the things that were great back in the the eighties, the early eighties, um, one in particular, the New Teen Titans, actually has quite an influence on the book that we're going to talk about today, or at least uh, some of the issues of the book we're going to talk about today. Uh, so, agreed, agreed. I think it's very much it ties to lots of b- bits of comic book history, but I think that might I wouldn't be surprised if that was where the creators started with Teen Titans. Yeah, yeah. Or New Teen Titans. And we'll we'll talk we'll probably talk a little bit more about that as we go on in in the uh, with the issues. Um, so I don't know when I discovered that Damien that you were into Danger Club, but as soon as I did, I was like, oh, finally, someone I could talk to about this book uh, eventually. So uh, Danger Club has long been on my list of things to focus on uh, in the podcast. And so when uh, I saw, I think, I think I just saw a tweet, maybe, uh, maybe it was one of the videos uh, of yours that I was watching you, you were talking about Danger Club. I think that was about the time that the, the final issue was coming out, perhaps a little earlier. I feel like we started talking about it maybe on the sixth or seventh issue. Okay. Back when, well, when I'm I came not back possibly. from the hiatus, right? Yeah. Anyway, so it was, yeah, it was, it was really cool to uh, encounter someone else who seemed to enjoy this book as much as I did. Right. There was only there was one other person in the the YouTube comic book community that was talking about it a lot, and then he stopped his channel. Um, so I feel like you and I are the only ones. I'm sure there are others out there, and I feel like it's good that we're doing this podcast or video and podcast because um, it's a potential hidden classic. I think at this point, I mean, I, that's a that's a really good way to put it. I I totally agree. Totally agree. And probably uh, a lot of its hiddenness has to do with its uh, bad publication schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I, we actually had a question. I, I threw it out on Twitter before we got started to see if anybody had any questions for us or comments about the series. And we did get one from our, our good friend, Travis, uh, asking about how the publication schedule may have affected our enjoyment of, of the book. And I think that's a question that we can actually table for next time, because what Damien and I are going to do for this, um, uh, this episode is to talk about the first four issues of Danger Club. And then uh, Damien will graciously join me at a later date to discuss the back end of the book. So we'll just do issues one through four. Um, let's talk a little, uh, uh, technicalities, uh, of the, the, the publication. Uh, so danger club, this is by, uh, mostly by Landry Q Walker, uh, written by him. Art is by Eric Jones with colors, magnificent colors. I'll just throw that out there right away, uh, by, uh, uh Rusty Drake. And there's a few more people that are involved. Um, let's see, uh, boy, I'm blanking on it. Um, Richard Starkings and Jimmy Bet- uh, Betancourt did the letters and logos, it says. And there are some uh, folks here that did flat flattening, which is that is that something the you've encountered? Technical step in coloring. You have yeah. to do flatting first before you can color. Yes. Color flats yeah. by Panel Vaughn and Derek Hunter, it says, in the first trade, which is volume one, the first four issues, volume one. Uh, it, the, the, uh, the title of that is Death. Very ominous. And I believe in some of the issues, there's an extra colorist for that first page, but not yeah. in all of them. Yeah, that's correct. There, there were some color assists uh, for, for a few pages. Um, I don't know if it's every issue, but it's, it's definitely in uh, a few. Especially in the first four. I guess I noticed that being the first page always being different than the rest of the comic, but perhaps yeah, we, we'll get to that in a bit. Yes, we, yeah. Oh, that, those first pages, that's one of the things I love about this book. So, yeah. Um, anyway, so the first four issues, the first issue was published in April of 2012. And then the second one came out in May 2012, about five ish weeks later. The third issue came out. 
in July, July 4th, actually, 2012. So what a way to celebrate Independence Day with with uh, a great comic book, right? <laughs> and then uh, then we start getting some somewhat more delays. Uh, issue four came out in October of 2012. And then we get definitely get some uh, major delays going into the back end of this series. So, and, and there, I mean, there is a particular reason because uh, in between issues three and four, this is when uh, Rusty Drake's kids were involved in an auto accident. Uh, they were hit by a truck. Wow. And, and yeah, and there, was, there was a point where I believe it was his, his son who it was touch and go there for a while. Obviously, things, you know, <laughs> your kids get uh, get into into such an accident. You know, you're you're not so worried about coloring a comic book. Uh, so I you know, once I heard that it was it was like, I don't care how long it takes. Uh, everybody get get their get their health in order and everybody is is feeling good about things and then get back to the comic. And I think that's how the, the other creators Landry Walker and Eric Jones felt definitely because they not only do, they not only did this book uh, together, but they've been longtime collaborators uh, along with Rusty on, on several things. Uh, Let's see Landry Walker and Eric Jones. I don't know if Russ Damien, do you know, did Rusty Drake work on the Supergirl comic that uh, Walker and Jones did for DC? I I don't know that level of, I uh, meant to look that up. And I, and but I, I, I do remember them talking about how they've worked with Rusty so much they didn't want to switch colorists. Um, right, right. That was out of the question for them, so they were just going to wait till he was ready. Yes, exactly. And I, I, I commend them for that. I, that, I think that's a, that was the best choice because we will talk about this as we get into the issues because the, the colors of this book really, for me, is a lot of what sells it. So that was the one thing as as when I read that first issue. Uh, that's, that's the thing that really popped out to me immediately was, was the, well, the, the first page construction, <laughs> we, we keep talking around these things, but that right. first page that we get in every issue and then the colors that just came out of that, just amazing stuff. So anyway, uh, that's it for the, the publication stuff. So let me. Let me start off here with, I'll read the, the solicitation for issue number one. So this is, so I'm flipping through previews back in, this would have been February-ish of 2012. And I see this, this uh, solicitation in Image Comics, that section of previews. And it says, uh, faced with the deadliest peril the universe had ever known, the world's greatest heroes left the earth to battle a nightmarish evil. And they never came back. Now only their teenage sidekicks remain. Will the Danger Club unite against this unknown cosmic menace? Or will their struggle for dominance destroy them? The critically acclaimed creative team of Landry Q. Walker and Eric Jones from Supergirl Cosmic Adventures in the 8th grade and Batman Brave and the Bold, which I did not know, so now I got to go seek out those issues, reunite to tell the apocalyptic tale of these titanic teens. I love that alliteration there. (laughs) And they got Titanic in there. That's right, Titanic. So they had me at Teenage Sidekicks right there. That I read that and I, I just said to myself, I'm in. What about you? Your well-known uh, addiction to sidekicks. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think what got me is I actually picked up, picked up on it late. So um, I heard someone else talking about it. And various things they said about it caught my attention. But I think it really was this um, comic book within a comic book aspect of the first page, leading then into a more modern take on the actual heroes. And one almost imagined these were comic books that exist in their world that are about them. And that just kind of tickled my fancy, kind of the part of me that that uh, really loves Alan Moore's ABC comics, like uh, Tom Strong and that kind of thing. I was looking for more of that. Um, And so I think that's what first attracted me to it. So yeah, that's, that's how I got started. I, I'm not, um, although I loved the Teen Titans, I am not generally thinking about uh, sidekicks, Um, (laughs) but it is in, uh, it is interesting. The idea of sidekicks without the heroes there. Um, Yes. So I quickly liked that idea. Yeah. And then quickly, I think being drawn in by that first 
page of the retro comic I was quickly drawn into the idea of this whole world that's fully populated already with a, a huge sort of rainbow of interesting sidekicks um, and, and an interesting world too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we get pretty quickly in this. Uh, let me, let me uh, add a little bit more. I, I found the official press release from image comics uh, forward danger club. Uh, added a little bit more than what is in the solicitation. Uh, let's see here. So it's up to this ragtag and fragmented group. So there, there you go. To battle the immense cosmic evil, that 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 phrase again, that uh, that threatens the world. But the fight could be over before it even starts if the sidekick struggle for dominance destroys them from the inside. Uh, here's a quote from Landry. Eric and I wanted to take their the typical assortment of sidekicks and strip them of their authority figures. So there you go. You just made that observation yourself. Uh, these are the most powerful beings on the planet, and the oldest is around 16. You take any group of teenagers and put them in pos in, a, in positions of absolute power, there will be some serious consequences. Some will seek to recreate the familiar, familiar hierarchy or attempt to establish their dominance while some will rise to the occasion. So, yeah, that's that's one thing that I've often kind of pondered yeah, as, as I said, I, I, and you mentioned as well, I love sidekicks. I love sidekick characters. Uh, this goes, goes back to Robin in the new teen Titans and, uh, just the, the, all of the, all of the DC sidekicks. I just, I just love that concept. Um, it's not always done very well. And so I was, I was very curious at what danger club could accomplish uh, with that concept based on my experience with other companies sidekicks and how they were treated over the years so have you, uh, have you tried to figure out why you like sidekicks so much <laughs> well because some of I, I just sorry uh because originally they were started because they thought that would make 10 year old kids like the comics more mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but that's I don't, probably not what they were like when you started reading them yeah i I think it had a lot more to do with uh, Marv Wolfman's and George Perez's depictions of the new Teen Titans. So the, la the late teenager phase uh, of those characters. Right. And there, especially with, with Dick Grayson's Robin in, in that series, it, it was uh, kind of what the struggles he was going through, you know, growing up, becoming his own person, an adult, dealing with you know, his father figure, Batman, how he fit into the world with his friends, the new teen Titans in um, college. Although I think at that point he, he had dropped out of college in, in that continuity, but you know, just, I was, I was about to enter that phase of my life. So I was kind of with, through Dick Grayson and the new teen Titans, I was kind of looking ahead in a way, but also feeling those feelings that I was reading right. about. So I, I just really identified with those characters in the way, like I said, that Wolfman and Perez uh, portrayed them. So, and then from there, it just became a logical extension. All of the other teenage sidekicks that came into and out of the new Teen Titans comics. And then, you know, other comics that I read, I just, I just like the concept. I, I like the younger characters. And I think there, there's something that, uh, that Landry and Walker talk about, um, I don't know if it was in that podcast that you sent me. I, that was a major spoilers podcast, correct? That we listened to? Uh, no. What was it called? It's a podcast that's centered around this particular artist who now slips my mind. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, you're right. Uh, the Taylor Network a podcast. That it was. It was from that that uh, the, the that uh, network. Yeah, um, he and his friend always go to a bar and interview somebody. That's um, right his name uh he does things like painted star trek novels and star trek meets doctor who and stuff okay so i i will i will uh try to remember to put that in the show notes for people to go listen to as well um in fact i'm going to make a note of that right now because so, i will forget well and if you'll pardon me the um when you were talking about the teen titans i realized the teen titans were already a uh a reversal or an inversion of the old uh, sidekick role because it was about the sidekicks doing it on their own. It used to be originally the sidekicks were a way to highlight how great the hero was. Correct. And so the Teen Titans took that and made it 
about what you were talking about, about breaking out on your own and, and establishing yourself beyond your father figure. So instead of the original idea of giving the kids something to relate to while reading Batman, it's now giving the kids something to relate to uh, while they are rebelling against their parents or right. while they're trying to establish their own identity. Exactly. As they grow up. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of, of that feeling uh, in danger club. Yes. In fact, I think danger club really, I mean, it's, it's uh, what 30 years apart between new teen Titans and danger club ish around 30 years, maybe 35, yeah, something like that. Think about how many years? Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> but I think danger club really, captures that quality in a, in a, in a way that maybe the new team Titans didn't. So, but, but built upon that framework into, uh, into what, what, uh, the, the structure that we get, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm tearing, I'm, I'm tearing that metaphor apart here, but, yeah. but the structure that we get in danger club with these characters in the situation. So, uh, I think maybe we should go ahead and get into the particular issues now. We've, yes, we've yes. talked around them quite a bit. So, yeah, Sorry for dancing around it so much, people. No, yeah, no, the, I, I, no. This, I, I, this is the kind of stuff I like, though. I mean, we can certainly talk about the issues and and what we like about them and and our observations, but just just talking about uh, the 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 ideas behind these stories. That's that's really what interests me uh, as as a reader and lover of comic books. Um, but let's let's get into it. I'll give a brief synopsis and then uh, Damien and I will just kind of riff off each other and talk about the things that we liked about uh, the particular issues. So here we go. Uh, the, the synopses here, <clears throat> I tried to be uh, just very general and not too spoilerific of them. Uh, oh, I guess, well, I guess I should mention, uh, although I don't know how you feel about this, Damien. Uh, I talked about this on, I think the the last, the gutters episode that I released, but uh, do we really need to care about the, us giving a spoiler warning anymore? I don't know. This book has been out since 2012. It just ended this year, and uh, I don't know. Anyway, well, if you haven't, we could say beyond it, this point, there will be spoilers. I mean, yeah, you can go yeah. get the trade or find the back right. easily. Buy them digitally, also easily. Exactly. Yeah, you you can get them and read them. Uh, but if you don't and care there about are the stuff, big moments in each issue. So to talk about the issues afterwards, it would be hard. Mm-hmm to not spoil some of those big moments. Right, right, exactly. Okay, anyway, so here we go. Um, but like I said, I, I'm, the the synopses, I try not to be too spoilerific because I want us to get to to arrive at those things as we go through the issues. All right, so there, there are several characters here in the books. I'm just going to name them real quick. We'll talk about them as we go on, though. Uh, Kid Vigilante, The Magician, and Jack Fearless, and they're kind of the three main characters of the book. Uh, gather to take on another character that they've encountered in their in their past called Apollo. Uh, Robot Nine, another character, goes to the moon to retrieve something. What is that exactly? Apollo is overseeing a contest of champions, uh, and then Kid Vigilante and his allies arrive to stop him because they, they he uh, Kid Vigilante sees this as a threat to uh, the situation. Robot Nine gives. Uh, Kid Vigilante, this these these uh, moon metal knuckles, which is, is a great concept, uh, and then he's able to defeat Apollo in this in this uh, this this fight that goes on in the first issue, and then fires a laser from from a an orbiting uh, satellite, <laughs> and that's pretty much how the first issue ends. Right. So the first issue is seemingly quite simple. Although, can I read on the fir- the page, the um, page before page one, where they say, uh, three months ago, the universe was in deadly peril. The world's greatest heroes were summoned into space to battle reality's ultimate evil. Our mentors, our guardians, our parents, our teachers, they left and they didn't come back. Yeah. So that's hovering over all. On one hand, we just have the kids fighting amongst themselves. You might just interpret that. On the other hand, there's some bigger problem that needs to be solved that Apollo, by trying to get all the other kid superheroes to be his followers, is keeping from happening, mm-hmm. keeping from fighting the menace. So I, I think that, that, that for, this first issue seems much simpler than it actually is. Um, yeah. I think, I think a lot of them are that way, too. When, you, when, you, when I was uh, writing the synopses, uh, the, the plot elements of the issues are really simple. 
there's not a lot going on plot wise but it's it's the it's the, the 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 background with the characters it's the interactions with the characters it's the reveals of this book that uh that really make this book come alive for me very true and in this issue, one of the things that's revealed is how brutal and violent these kids are to each other. Oh, my gosh, yes. And I really noticed that on a second read. And I also read this issue digitally just recently. And with the close-ups of the panel to panel, um, just like uh, first kid vigilante takes a real ass whooping from from Apollo. And then he gets his brass knuckles from outer space, which have spikes on them and literally shreds uh, Apollo's face. Um, here's actually, for those people who are watching on YouTube, here's just one panel close up on it, which is actually one of the less violent panels uh, <laughs> of someone being shot in the ear by the, uh, the girl from Micro Tokyo. I, I forget her name. She, she's the one who flies the robot. Yes. But yeah, I'm trying to find, anyway, there, there, it's really ver a very brutal experience. And so it, it, one of the things this first issue introduced to me was we are in a brutally violent universe, even though it's all these colorful characters and everything. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's funny you touch on that because uh, in one of the interviews that I, I, I found online uh, about the book, um, Eric Jones is quoted as saying, this is a visceral book. It's brutal dark and angry and boy is it and to me that i i think maybe this is a bleed over from later issues but it kind of emphasizes this sense that there was maybe something immoral about training all these teenagers to fight and <laughs> get involved in this stuff at their age yeah, yeah so that the authors of this want teenage i didn't even realize the oldest was 16 i figured maybe 17 and down but um you know 15, 16, 17-year-olds ripping up each other's faces and, and doing other brutal things to each other um, because they've been trained as superheroes. Right. And it's funny you mentioned that too, uh, the, the age thing. Uh, that's one of the things that I pointed out in my notes about this is that I love how Eric Jones draws these teenage kids. They look like, for the most part, they look like teenagers. Whereas when you compare them to the so-called teen heroes of, of say DC or maybe even, uh, you know, Marvel comics. Um, they tend to look like just slightly shorter versions of the adult counterparts. Right, and right. they don't, to me, they don't look like teenagers. They look just, they look like adults that are uh, slightly smaller. And that's right. It. Even in, in our beloved teen Titans. Yeah. <laughs> generally George <laughs> Perez draws them just the way he would any superhero. Pretty much. Yeah. So, guess, uh, beast boy looks a little, a little bit younger. Yeah, right. Right. Well, yeah, that's a good comparison because Beast Boy was supposed to be about 16 in in that book, in that right. run. And he even he looked mm, quite muscly compared to right. what I did when I was 16. Right. So, These are all skinny. The mo the boys are all skinny little guys, which is yeah. what most teenagers are like. And yeah, they have kind of baby face, baby fat in their faces still and stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think we're, we keep getting ahead of ourselves uh, a little bit, but that's okay. But let's so let's let's uh, oh God, before we do that um, you so you read that that uh, that introduction on, on the inside cover of the issue what did you think of those in general uh, did you did you appreciate them uh, did you find them uh, dis distracting to the story or I appreciate them and I, I think I mean a, I try to weigh whether it's a plus or a minus to Danger Club but I think mostly a plus. It's even though sometimes the plots are simple, it's very dense. And some of the density is set up just by that opening, <clears throat> opening setup. Just a few words about what happened in the past makes everything different about the whole comic book mm -hmm. um, than you would read it without. And I think that's definitely why the density in general is why I've enjoyed rereading them maybe even more than the first time I read them. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, when I, I don't know how you how you read comics, Damien, but you know I'll I'll read my issues, I'll enjoy them, and then I put them away, and I rarely go back and reread things because I've got so many other things that I haven't read yet, so <laughs> I, I I don't have much of an uh, or, or I don't avail myself of the opportunities to go back and reread things, 
uh, except for when I do things like this. So this is really good <laughs> for that for that very reason. But yes, going through these this these issues again just made me appreciate the story telling and and uh, the overall production uh, uh, even more. Yeah, I just I got a lot more out of it. I liked it a lot. I instinctively kind of liked it the first time, but I feel like this time I'm seeing why I liked it so much and yeah. and seeing extra layers to it. Yeah. Okay. So now let's finally get to it. Uh, the, for the first issue. So we've talked about them, but here we have, and Damien, I think you showed this already, but you have uh, that first page, which is my big hands in the way here. Mysterious moon menace. Yes. So you, you get these and I, I equated them as, and I think you mentioned this too, but they, they, they come across to me as kind of like these sil- they, ha- they have a silver age quality to them. Right. And they're even the way that they're colored is different from the rest of the book. So you get this kind of uh, uh, an old, older time feel to it. And you have the, the even the dialogue, you know, it says uh, Apollo is he's got his hand up motioning to the danger club, which is re- referencing these, these other uh, characters, which on here on the first page, it says the Titanic t- team trio. So we have Kid Vigilante, Jack Fearless and the Magician. So th- that's the Danger Club, I presume. Did you take it that way, too? Yes, the core Danger Club was. Those right. Three. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, they're fighting this menace from another realm. And he's like, step aside, mortals. This is a job for a true Olympian. And, and then the, the dialogue that follows from the, 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 the trio is no, Apollo, you're powered by the sun you're no match for his moon metal. It's just, it's so silver age in its quality. Right. And, 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 uh, and the way that the, the dialogue is, is, is being shown. It's just, I love, I love it. It's, 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 it's a, it's a new age take on, on a silver age trope, I guess is, right. is kind of what I'm and getting it, at. It, it, it's kind of the silver age you want to read <laughs> when I see it. It's like, it, Oh, yeah. I wish I could find that silver age. Comment. As opposed to the silver age stuff that we actually got. Is that <laughs> frequently the silver age stuff we actually got, especially from DC, which this yeah. me of, was a little less fun than, yeah. than you real, would hope from the cover or. Yeah. The real, the real sanitized, um, gosh, uh, kind of lame <laughs> stuff from the silver age, you know, when they didn't want to rock any boats, they just wanted to sell some books right. and so anyway, but anyway, uh, and then, but then you also get this little, this, the, the second panel on here is, you know, the bonus, you have these two characters, uh, kid monstro and the princess, which we never see again. And, and we'll, I, we'll probably talk about that, but they're investigating the mansion of madness. And I, I just love the little, the little, uh, the, the, the caption here from, from the princess, they're going into this, this mansion and she just, all she says is neat. <laughs> I just, I, 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 I don't, I, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I love, I just love this silver age quality of these, these introductory pages. Uh, what, what these pages do beyond entertaining me <laughs> though right. is, is to give a little bit of background, uh, for these characters. So like I mentioned, uh, the, the princess and kid monstro, they are referenced pretty early on in the next few pages uh, so at least there's some tie in there. We, we get to see them, what they look like, um, but something happens with them. More importantly, though, is that that uh, that first panel that we we showed on the video uh, with Apollo and the and the, the trio, because they we know that they used to work together in some fashion. Right. Uh, so they have a history together, these characters, even though. If we go by what uh, what Walker said in the interview, you know, Kid Vigilante is sixteen. So how old are they in this in this panel? You know, so there's only a few years here where they've interacted with each other, but they do have that history, and it comes into play in, in this issue, in this very issue. So exactly, but it also this is perhaps the facade that the public would see, in a sense, mm-hmm. because even when we find out some mentions of their previous adventures, it sounds like they never really liked each other. I think there's reference to that later in the issue, but yeah. Yeah. With Apollo. Exactly. Did you, Damien, did you take these? Cause you, because you mentioned, you know, the, the, the public face of the, of, of these, these characters. Um, one thought I had was, are these, are these things, um, 
in this in the Danger Club universe, are these comic book adaptations of these characters' adventures in that universe? That's what I took it to be. And maybe it's from having read so much Alan Moore where in several of his books, there are comic books in his universe. Mm -hmm. Um, In Tom Strong, there's a Tom Strong fan club and there are Tom Strong comic books which show his origin and things like that that we see within the Tom Strong comic that we read. So I kind of took it to be that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And it don't actually, ever really tell us or explain that. I don't. Right, think. right. I actually didn't think about that. I just took it um, initially uh, when I first read through these issues. It was only when I was rereading them that I thought, well, maybe that's what they're going for. Uh, otherwise, I thought they were just kind of playing around with. Well, and they do not kind of they they uh, these guys, the creators of the book play around with a lot of different tropes of superhero comic books and i thought they were just throwing this this first page in as a way to like i said it it, it really draws you in because it's it's different from what we expect for a modern comic book reading audience and so i just kind of took it sort of at a face value but then as i said when i when i was rereading i thought well maybe maybe that's what's going on here um but i do i do like how every one of these pages and we'll probably talk about each one as we get into each issue, but whatever is shown on the page, there is some connection to what comes after that page in the main story. And that's what I really like about it. And we don't get a lot of history, like with uh, the princess and kid monstro thing, this whole uh, mansion of madness. And for that one, you can kind of, there might be some connections to a later issue when, when, um, the characters go after the the empire of evil or, or whatever that group is. Right. But you don't, you don't get a, a direct connection with that particular story that's hinted at on this first page, but, but the characters do talk about those two specific characters and what happened to them within the, the main story. So I really like how there's always a connection here. You may not always see it immediately, but there is something within that issue that connects you to what the, the silver age prelude that first page uh, is talking about so okay anything else about <laughs> that first page just that i love the contrast uh, as you go from that first page to the second page and the art entirely changes the mood entirely changes we're in a dark m- world where people are frowning all the time and um kind of sneering at each other <laughs> and everything looks kind of bombed out so it's the contrast between the pages that I yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, and, and not only that, but just, okay. So we talked about the color a little bit, but just the coloring of that first page, when you get those, those really deep reds and oranges compared to the kind of the washed out quality of that first page, uh, yeah. it's just, just it, that's just incredible. And, but yes, it, it, contrast that with kind of like the darker backgrounds, the, 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 uh, the 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 destruction of this of the that part of the city that we see in you know, like on page three of the book you know it's just right. an incredible contrast uh, even Kid Vangelani's costume which is a uh, this really dark blue as you, as as you're showing there in the panel with yeah. with yeah. that um, what would you say that's like a, a red violet sort of color that forms the V and his gloves I think that's a pretty good oh, I'm uh, sorry oh 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 yeah it's um. Yeah, I don't know what color you'd call that, but nothing is a straightforward color. It's all yes, yes. In that's I, I love. That's another thing I love about the art is is how the colors really aren't. I mean, it's not like you, it's not like a, an old um, even you know like Bronze Age comic where the the color palette was very limited uh, based on the technology they had compared to now where they the colors can just pop off the page. Uh, the 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 doorway that the magician creates and walks through with the, the coloring there at the bottom there, it's like this really bright orange. It, it's almost li- like you're seeing light on the page True, as, mu- as much as you could possibly do. So on a printed on printed material, it's, yeah. it's just amazing. The well, stuff that uh, the colorists are doing not to advertise digital too much for people who hate it, but th- this is one <laughs> of those comics where you can really get a lot out of the, the digital coloring. Um, because then it really is like light on the page. Uh, like with that. 
that picture there. And then I guess he goes through. Yeah, there you go. It's yeah, just amazing. The yeah, when you get that close up like that, that's really that's really awesome. I'm I I'm not I guess I'm not as big a fan, Amy, <laughs> because I, I did not buy the digital issues. <laughs> Not yet anyway. No, not yet, but I, I plan to. I actually have two copies of each issue because when I went to oh, well, then uh, you're a big fan. <laughs> I went to uh the Emerald City Comic Con this last time and uh Mr. Walker was there and so I, I made it a point to go talk to him and he he uh, he he sold me the issues he had, he signed them for me. And uh so I have double issues, I have the two trades. And I have issue number eight digitally. So the completest in me needs to go buy issues one and seven digitally <laughs> as well. So <laughs> I, won't, I won't be able to help myself. Um, but that's how good this comic is, guys. This, this is, is, it's such a good, good story. So, okay. Um, and the body language on these pages is so different too. And they look like insecure teenagers, the way they're standing around and looking down at the ground and not looking each other in the eye and, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I noticed on my second reading of it. Do you think that's just because of their age or, uh, cause I kind of took it as they have this, the situation that they have to deal with. Um, and it's only what, what to say at the beginning here, it's three months since their mentors and their parents, you know, the adults in their lives have disappeared in this, um, this blaze of glory that as far as they know, uh, situation. So they're still kind of, uh, they're grieving true you know, from the loss of, of these, of these characters, uh, in their lives. So, and, and the, the, the enormity of the situation that they're dealing with right now, which is to go after their sort of ally Apollo. Right. They're much more powerful ally Apollo. Yes, exactly. Uh, anything about those, those two pages, Damien, two and three that you want to point out? I think other than the, the postures and stuff, that was, you know, and that we see it's a bombed out world. It's not a very good place to live anymore. Probably. I don't know if that's always been that way or just because the superheroes have left. Yeah. I think, well, I think mostly because the superheroes have left. Yeah. I, they do make comments about that, but they never explicitly come out and say, this is a direct result of this thing, whatever that happens to be. And that's one of the things right. I like about the book. So I, I will, I just want to point out here on page three that they show Jack fearless in, in one panel near the bottom where he refers to Monstro who we saw. Yeah. Uh, anyway, but, but you have, you have kid vigilante there also. And so you have the three characters showing, I got a bit of a glare on the anyway, but you, so you got, you got these familiar tropes of characters as well. So kid vigilante is, you know, more or less the Robin. Uh, right. of the situation. Uh, Jack Fearless looks just like Nick, Nick Fury, Fury, right? A young Nick Fury, which interesting. But he later, well, I don't know if we want to talk about what he later turns out to be. Uh, I th it, that comes up in the, in the, in the, in the is in issue four, I think. So yeah, yeah. We, can, we can talk about that. Okay. I mean, he turns out to be more of a Bucky figure. Exactly. Which That's is an interesting inversion of, of that trope too. And then the magician is just, well, just a magical character, but I don't think he has a direct analog. Um, uh, in, in I don't think of magical characters that have had sidekicks, but he certainly in the, I don't know, in well, the realm have, of Doctor Strange and yeah. Well, you have Z Zatanna and 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 her father, but I, but yeah, Zatanna a different. and her father. I guess there's yeah. that. Well, and they actually we do have that that direct connection with um, the Wonder Wizard and Samantha that gets revealed later. So, so there uh, is that, but, but, but the magician character himself is, is a, even, even uh, a further uh, connection down the line from that, that direct um, analog between like say the DC characters and here, regardless, you, we, we see a lot of, of these kind of analogs and I know Walker and Jones wanted to play with those things as well uh, in particular. So, so at, at the very least, we as readers come into this, even though we don't know the background, the history, what exactly is going on when the story starts, uh, we are comforted, I think, in the familiarity of these character tropes. We understand them visually, instinctively, and we just right. kind of go with it. 
the the a character that looks like Nick Fury, who's possibly fifteen years old, smoking a cigar, is a bit striking. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Um, so I was always very curious about him. I, I have to say, as a criticism of this book, a little bit, it's very hard to figure out what the names of the characters are. <laughs> I, I wish that would have been a little easier to know who was who. Yeah, you. I'm, you, I'm thinking of him as oh, there. Well, Kid Vigilante, I picked up pretty soon, but otherwise, I was like the Nick Fury guy and the Wizard guy, and you know, rather than knowing what their names are. Um, eventually, if you pay really close attention, you can find out the names of everyone. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but again, that I, I've touched on this before, but I really like that quality. I, I did not, I don't like being hit over the head with things as I'm reading a story. Uh, and that's one of the things, uh, you know, when I used to write fiction, uh, that's one of the things that I always try to do is come up, I, I would not always, I'd have a backstory uh, for the the story that I was telling, but I didn't, and I would, I, the characters would refer to things, but I wouldn't just explain everything in, in the story that I was writing. And, and I really appreciate that, that Walker and Jones, how they do that in this. So something's happened. Uh, these characters have to go deal with it and they just make passing mention. Like here, here on that page, we, we get that mention of kid monster on the princess they're out of play in this situation now because of this, this attack from the sky pirates, whoever they are. We, we don't, we never know who, who the, who the sky pirates are, but, right. but we can, you know, it, it, that's, they're just a group. We, we, we don't need to know exactly who they are. We don't even need to see them. And we don't, uh, all we know, all we need to know is that these characters are no longer in play. And these, these three characters in particular are, they appear to me anyway, to be really apprehensive about what they have to deal with right now. But I do think that lack of information to me makes it signals that this is a book more for the hardcore comic book reader and less new reader friendly, even okay. though we're all new readers to this world. But you need to be <laughs> secure in your comic book reading and superhero reading experience to not know who everybody is and still keep reading. It's it's like when you mm -hmm. pick up an issue, you know, somewhere in the middle of the story arc or something. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good point. I actually that that that's something that I would I would love to hear from anybody watching this video or listening to the audio version of this. Uh, if if you have if you had experience with this book or even other books like it in the sense that you didn't get all this information uh, as you're reading the story, you know how how do you feel about that? Is that do you like that? Do you do you prefer to have a little bit more so that you get into the story or or what? So um, make sure you uh, give me some feedback along those lines. Uh, okay. So anything else we want to talk about those pages? I think I'm good as far as that. Okay. We were really talking a lot about the individual stuff, but <laughs> there's just a lot to talk about. Um, on the next two pages, there's a, there's a, there's a two page spread. And just from a, an artist storytelling standpoint, there you go. Right. It, it looks really good. And oh, sorry, you were going to say, I was just saying the the flow of of the story on the page is I love the way that Eric Jones did that. So you have at the top you have the the longer panels spanning across, and right. then you get you go down, and then you have the panels that are inverted, and then overlapping and continuing across, so that you you know it it flows. It it you know it does that that backwards backwards right. s or no not backwards s, but it has that curvy pattern on a page to get you from the top left of this two page spread to the bottom right of, of the second page. It's just oh, wonderfully constructed. And it does show the, the world the, lar the, larger, the larger, larger bombed out world that we're yeah. in. Yeah. So, so from the first few pages, we're going from the small, the micro level to more of a macro level as, as we are being introduced to the universe in that same sense. So I, I love the, how the visuals and, and just the, that, that, the way that the storyline is is getting wider and wider and showing us more and more. So wonderfully story, wonderful storytelling there. And to throw it against digital comics, this is the kind of thing you've got to appreciate on the page. Um, Walk or Jones is a really good visual storyteller, taking you from moment to moment really skillfully. Yeah, yeah. Which is then showed off on the if you don't. Or did you have more to say about these pages? Uh, just some stuff about the, the the dialogue here. Kid Vigilante talks about Apollo being a bastard. Uh, with the hero's gone, he's now the most powerful bastard on the planet. So it's up to them to take care of the situation. We don't know exactly what that situation is or why they feel they have to do this. Magician says, 
Yeah, well, I hope you're right. Vigilante says, I'm always right. It's my superpower. <laughs> right. I love that. I love that. That was, and we're left wondering: is that really his superpower? Exactly. Or does exactly. He just you, say that <laughs> we don't know what yet what that means exactly. So yeah, that is a brilliant touch there. Um, he really looks like a kid in that picture. It's like this kid saying his super, this uh, possibly fifteen year old or something saying, "My superpower is to always be right." Yeah. Right. Trust right. Trust the teenager on that level. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and oh, now you bring it up. What teenager doesn't think that they don't know everything? True. So, but do any teenagers think any other teenagers know what they're talking about? <laughs> well, or anybody else for that matter, but yeah. <laughs> True, yeah. Okay. Uh the next two pages we have we are, we see Robot 9 for the first time. Uh there's right. there's this, this is two silent pages. For the most part, yeah. Which that that was oh, pretty cool. Some talk on the last uh, bottom of the second page yeah, yeah. so uh robot nine is landing on the moon we see the pilot of this uh this robot uh what's her name yoshimi maybe yoshimi yes exactly there you go i had it in my notes but i i, I can't find it so just to show for the people who are watching this these are my notes handwritten notes that i did here eric does his homework <laughs> It took a while. That is just through page two for this first issue. That what I just showed you. <laughs> Full page, single spaced, uh, handwritten notes. So anyway, I'm far lazier. <laughs> well, I'll yeah, tell you what. So I was just impressed by the visual storytelling. They didn't need words here, so they didn't give them to us. Exactly. We learned exactly. there's a little girl inside the giant robot piling at it. That she's on the moon blasting something uh probably looking for something now when you say little girl when you first read this what what do you what did you what do you mean by little girl right well she's physically very petite but we learn later exactly how little she is exactly at this point, right. we don't know exactly because um, it's a giant robot yeah but yeah so uh, the way that she's portrayed uh and we'll get it yeah, Yoshimi, it says her name right there. That's right. Um, but yeah, the way that she's drawn, she she looks very young uh, piloting this big robot thing. So you could be an 11 year old the way she's drawn. Here. Exactly. Yeah. How, yeah, exactly. How old are some of these characters doing what they do? It's just amazing. Considering what comes up in the storyline, it's just amazing that the how these characters deal with and adapt to these situations. It's just Probably unrealistic, but then again, it is a superhero comic, so we kind of take that as, by uh, take it as uh, for granted that <laughs> they can handle these impossible situations so calmly, uh, or as much as they can. Next up, the the characters go to the stadium in the city, and this I, I mentioned in this in the synopsis. This is the the contest of champions that Apollo is doing. And we are introduced to a character that is referenced as Vesuvius. And you get this great panel showing this character. Yeah, that's a really awesome panel. I love that one. Yeah, there you go. So it's there's one of the many times where I went, oh, I want more of this world. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So this, this, uh, wh wh he's a living volcano, right? Maybe right. they even call him that. But uh, the, 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 the name certainly uh, suggests that's what it is. But just that visual there with the, with uh, the, the smoke and the fire and everything. And he's punching some character. So uh, Apollo is, is uh, recruiting his, his, how, his group. I don't know. How, right. how would you... It's not totally clear to me what Apollo, he, he's having them fight to the death, I think, but saying, or maybe not to the death, but saying that he loves them all and he's going to make them his family. So it, he does reference, this is where we see who is worthy to join me. And so you, you, he, you challenge his champions to become part of, Oh, his elite. He does say my elite. Right. here, um, But he does want everybody there to, to obey and be loyal and worship him. Right. So I guess he just wants them to, to beat the stuffing out of each other. And then the champions will be his elite and the rest will also follow him. He wants yeah. worshipers. <laughs> well, 
which made me think that maybe this is, uh, you know, often in comics, when you, when we get introduced to God characters or godlike characters, uh, the str- their strength is derived in many ways from, or their power is derived at least from their worshipers, how many worshipers they have, how ver- how uh, fervent their worship is, and so I, I was wondering, is that what we're dealing with here, uh, or is it, you know, is he just being metaphorical? But but you're right, he there. It is not clear why he's doing what he's doing. Why is he amassing this army? Is it to right. to to defend against? Uh, this this menace or some other purpose. Uh, Kid Vigilante on the next few pages, at least when he confronts Apollo, uh, is saying he at least is implying at the very least that that's not what Apollo's objectives here is. So right. What exactly is he up to? Is but we I don't think we ever find out. But it doesn't matter. Well, certainly from the evidence of this issue, we could think that it's actually just two rivals, each who view the other as the bad guy. I mean, we can't be sure what's going on here. So do you think that Apollo is amassing this army because he knows that Kid Vigilante is going to come after him at some point? Well, I think when I've read this first issue without having read further issues, I thought perhaps Apollo is, this is Apollo's way of preparing for what he's, for this invasion that they're all expecting at this point from outer space. However, it's not clear. It, it's, it's, it seems that Kid Vigilante and his group believe that the only thing Apollo is doing is taking advantage of the uh, superheroes not being here to, to become the leader because mm-hmm. he just wants to be the leader and wants right. to be worshipped. Right. Uh, we, this is our first time of, like I said, we were talking about expanding the universe as we're reading through the issue. This is the first time that we see a lot of other teenage sidekick characters uh amassed in one area it's really i it was really striking to me two things about these the, this these few pages and what follows uh eric jones likes to draw these really big eye masks uh-huh. on these characters that fill fill their the top of their the character's cheeks and goes up into their forehead area uh which is really an interesting choice uh, and and uh most of them with few exceptions in this book, most of them have the white eyes that we're used to right. for superheroes that wear masks. So that, that I thought that was interesting. But like, but you had, you had mentioned before, Damien, how you know there's so many so many teenage sidekicks in the world. There there are dozens here in 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 this in this part of the story. How many superheroes are in this world? Right, that and chosen many- to have sidekicks. <laughs> Yeah, you would think it's, you know, somewhere between 50 and 100, maybe, or, yeah, that's how I kind of sensed it, about 100. Yeah, so, wow, that that's a lot of characters. Even I don't think even DC has that many sidekick characters <laughs> over its 75-year history. Well, and I do wonder whether they were being mesmerized in some way by Apollo or, or just doing it out of their own... Um, what's the word shallowness <laughs> their willingness to worship apollo cuz they are all shown with white eyeballs let's see and in this bottom panel even ones who aren't wearing am i showing it i can't yes. tell yep. even yes. ones who are not wearing masks yeah. have white eyes mm-hmm. um well i think that i don't know if that's stylized <laughs> or whether it's really supposed to indicate they're all kind of mesmerized yeah perhaps i, I didn't take it that way i just thought this was a stylistic choice for uh, by Eric Jones for character. You know, like I said, the characters who wear masks, they, they have white eyes. Um, and I think that maybe detracts or, or at least suggests something that maybe isn't there. Or maybe it was intentional to do that. I don't know. At this point, we just don't know what's what's going on and why. We're just absorbing as we go. But uh, as you said, something about Apollo uh, the, uh, on the next couple pages. So Jack Fearless does say something about that. At first, I thought maybe... Apollo was using some kind of Greek god power to make everyone love him. And then okay. Magician shoots that down saying, no, I'd sense it if it was magic. You're right. And, You're and right. Vigilante says, the bottom line, it doesn't matter. It ends now. He's building an army and given his personality, we can't wait any longer. And he says, it's time to beat the hell out of this son of a bitch. So again, we get that. <laughs> this ain't your mama's new Teen Titans, right? <laughs> right. 
I can't imagine Robin uh, words like that coming out of Robin's mouth back in the and 80s. It sounds like he's going to enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. Here's that that brutal, visceral quality of, of these characters in this world. It's like, wow. Imagine, imagine if they were, uh, if Walker and, and and Jones went really wild, you know, into the R-rated territory of <laughs> of of this book. You know, I you know I can imagine it'd be like a game Game of Thrones type um, uh, has uh, a quality to it. Uh, with these characters and, and and the way they talk and the way they act. I mean, it's already, it's already pretty close in some ways with the violence, but uh, I, boy, it could be maybe even somewhat painful to read if it went even further than it did. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, uh, like I said, on the, on the next few pages, so the battle's about to begin. Did you notice Damien? Uh, there's that one panel where Kid Vigilante jumps down uh, Apollo isn't aware of this just yet. He's still talking to his congregation, but then Kid Vigilante has this this ball in his hand. Right. This, I don't know what it is. Some kind then, of device, Batman-like device. That exactly. That but, was yeah. While Apollo's not looking. Exactly. This this big, yeah. really powerful living volcano, and he he's taken out by this little thing that it gets that gets uh, they, where he gets hit in the head by. What the heck is that? Right. <laughs> Again. Again, we don't know and we really don't need to know, but it's, I, I just love that quality where it's like, bang, the big guy is taken care of and we can get to what is the really the, the, the point of this scene, which is the battle between uh, the, the, the so-called powerless hero or, or non, non-superpowered hero and this god. Yep. With the rest of the team, uh, the magician and uh, Jack Fearless going after the uh, what, what was referred to earlier in, in the pages as the new Olympians. So uh, the uh-huh. Apollo's uh, honor guard or, or whatever, however you want to put it. Uh, Robot nine is coming uh, again. We get the, the wonderful colors here. You can see again, the, the orange and reds. And then also you get, you get these purplish violet colors as well. Mm-hmm. And that's, that is uh, that just runs through this issue. So you get these, re- these really warm colors. If you, if you think about the, the color palette, these are, these are actually considered warmer colors. Right. And except for maybe the purplish, but used in this way, you know, these warm colors, but, but, uh, used in a very violent fashion. So that's, that's an interesting choice. Uh, right. how it often kind of stimulates the brain in a certain way. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> hardcore. But, how often do you see that purple color in comics in general? <laughs> that is, I, I just love that. I, well, maybe, maybe you do may, uh, just in the comics that I read, I don't see it very often. So I'm seeing more and more unusual colors in comics. I think the, yeah. the colors are, are learning lots of new tricks lately, but oh, I agree no. that the color is very, a very strong element here. Uh, oh, Damien, I just, I just turned the page. I just realized that the, the, this 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 set of pages just came out of from the staples in my book. Oh, I had devastated. that happen in one of my other issues, actually. Oh, really? Oh, that's oh, it just pains me to see that. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, lo- a loose center page is one of my big bugaboos. Yeah. Oh, that, that and a ripped cool. cover are the two things that drive me. Dang down. it! Good thing I have another issue or another copy of this issue. Uh. <laughs> okay. Well, didn't you mention? Did you also buy the trades? Yes, <laughs> but I like the floppies better. <laughs> yeah, well, the floppies are, especially with uh, art like this. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so basically in the next few pages, it's just a big fight scene between the char- all of the characters going on here. Right, it gives us a chance to see a bunch of different super sidekicks. Yeah. I love the guy with the skull mask on, if that is a mask. Oh no! Look, look at uh, look at the earlier page when uh, we see. I think it's page this uh, seven or eight, where we first see the Apollo with his group. There's just a floating s- skull uh, on that body. It looks like yeah. to me, anyway. That was that's an interesting character oh, yeah. design. Oh yeah, is that the same one? I guess I think it so. Is. In this picture, you can't tell his skull is floating, but yeah, yeah I like that one. But I like a bunch of them. So we, we're sort of, this is sort of the fight before the important fight, though. Yeah. 
bottom of the following page where it says, all right, round two is where exactly. we're getting the so things, yeah, the tide turns uh, in, in the fight with... Uh, oh, and Vigilante get his ass yes, yes. pictures, and we feel sorry for him, or I did when I was reading this. Uh-huh. But oh, then, no. but like I said, when he it's says, crazy. all right, round two, you mentioned how, how the characters, or how he, uh, when, he jumped, when he was jumping into the arena, you know, he was maybe looking forward to this. That smile. Yeah. Uh, his face. He's, he's bleeding from one eye, from his nose, from his mouth. The, 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 on his chest, the blood is just collecting on his costume and he's smiling about this. Right. This guy is vicious. Yeah. He's looking forward to the, to the, the way he set Apollo up because mm-hmm. Apollo thinks he's winning. Well, yeah, that just the look on Apollo's face in that following panel, he's like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> I guess bring it on you foolish yeah. mortal. Uh, and then uh, uh, Yoshimi delivers those knuckles, and right. then Apollo's Apollo's face changes, his demeanor changes. So that's the first hint at how small Yoshimi is, because she's carrying the knuckles in a giant suitcase, or what appears to be a giant suitcase. Right, right, yeah. Because in all these panels, other than the one that you just described, where this this suit this uh, suitcase looks really big to her on her. Oh, okay. So then there, there is a panel here where she's actually delivering the suitcase to Kid Vigilante. And that's the first time we, yeah, we definitely we see, see that, she is, that yeah. she is about, what, five, maybe six inches tops right. tall? Right. So yeah, she is a small girl in a, in a large robot. Uh, so then we get uh, the, the battle starts again. And there's that there's the panel there where Yoshimi shoots the girl. You showed that earlier in the video uh, shoots her in the ear. And that's where in my notes, Damien, I, I go, wow, this comic is really violent to show. I mean, to show that to show someone getting shot in the ear is just that just that's worse to me than than the beating that Kid Vigilante was taking right. from Apollo and the blood coming out of the ear and spattering. Yeah. Of yeah. It. Oh, wonder, wonderfully done by uh, I assume that's that's Rusty's Rusty Drake's right. contribution yeah. there. And then you get the the you get the big splash page here of the big punch. The big punch. With and again, gun. you get you get the purple, the purplish colors on the page. Right. So nicely done there. I don't that doesn't seem like one of his best action scenes, that particular page, but for a splash page. But yeah, I, I, think, uh, that's I think you're right. Picky. Yeah. Because I, I like the next page a lot more, actually. Like like is a weird word because someone is getting all their teeth knocked out. <laughs> okay. Why do you like this next page more? <laughs> uh, the action is so visceral and so well choreographed, I guess. Mm-hmm. And the coloring is amazing, too, there. And my whole feeling about what was going on turned around when I first read this. I went from feeling bad from Kid Vigilante to <laughs> feeling bad for Apollo and not being sure anymore if I like Kid Vigilante. Yes. And that's, you know, in the earlier scenes, that we, we can look back and see how he was looking forward to the fight and everything, but I didn't really pick up on exactly what all that meant until here, mm-hmm. where it's like he's looking forward to just totally trashing this guy. Maybe he has to do it for the safety of the world, but he's he's going to relish it. It was probably his ideas to make those things spiky rather than just regular brass knuckles. <laughs> well, it, it kind of reminded me um, of, I don't know if you've, did you ever read Ender's Game? Yes, I read it a long time ago, but. Yeah. So yeah, th- there's the scene, and I, boy, forgive me, I don't remember the characters' names. Um, uh, Ender ends up fighting this bully early on in the story. Uh-huh. and And he knows he has to not just not just defeat the bully, he has to do it in a way that will prevent any future recurrences of this, of this, of this bully and, and just viciously beats this character down. Um, I think he even breaks an arm or a leg or something in in the story. I don't, I don't really, really remember, but it reminded me of that. Uh, so that, uh, Apollo not only is defeated here, but 
in the future as well. Of course, that's a little, we find a, little, a few different things or at least one different thing uh, in a future issue. But at this point in the story, it seems like vigilante, Kid Vigilante is certainly exerting his dominance here in the, in the, in, via the, the vicious, brutal beating that he, he, he uh, uh, imparts upon right. Apollo. I will, I will note to these pages, I, at least in the first issue, maybe the first two, I, I, I have to look at my notes, but it seems like there's a lot of close-ups of, of hands and arms in this book. And I don't, I'm not sure exactly if that's just the way that Eric Jones wanted to portray the action scenes, but there's a lot of, a lot of appendages being shown uh-huh. in, a, in a way that I don't think I've ever seen in any other book. Huh. I, like I said, I don't know what that means or, or if it means anything, but it, there's a lot of, a lot of that, especially on the page that you, you were just, you were describing that you liked. Right. That was a lot of arm and fist crossing the page. Yeah. I assume that's just his kind of style of showing action is, is yeah. extending the arms. Yeah. Um, I did think when we find out that um, the knuckles, the brass knuckles come from the moon or they're not brass. Of course, they're made from some, there's one thing that can hurt you. Look what Yoshimi found on the moon. And then I go back to the very first page with the moon menace, uh, where they tell Apollo, you're no match for his moon metal. Mm-hmm. So that what we saw in that scene, even though it was all silver agey and, and with a patina of innocence, was a hint of something, you know, to come later in the book. Exactly. And in fact, the villain there has spikes on his knuckles. So that's the reason perhaps for the spikiness of the, mm-hmm. of the knuckles that he gets later. And I don't know if I noticed that on the first reading or not. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, so then, uh, of course, Kid Vigilante beats Apollo and then starts talking to the crowd. This threat that our mentors went off to fight, it's still coming. You need Basically, you need to join me or get out of the way. That's his message. Right. And then, and then uh, tells them that he's, let's see here. I've commandeered an orbital defense satellite. Its weapons are locked onto these coordinates. You have 60 seconds to leave. <laughs> 60 seconds. That's he is not messing thing. around. And of course given that he's beaten a God. And uh, I assume that kid vigilante just in general has this uh, um, reputation (laughs) among these teen, these teen sidekicks that they just scatter as quickly as possible. Right. (laughs) One of them looks like the green lantern here. I just, that's funny. I just noticed that myself uh, just before you said that. So yeah. Yeah. He doesn't have a ring on, but right. (laughs) Yeah, and then the final page, if I may. Um, go ahead. They go ahead with it. They There's the bloody and beaten Apollo, and a beam comes down from a satellite and pretty much appears to nuke him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I took, when I read this issue the first time, Apollo is dead. Right. As far as, far as we know, he's, he's dead. What could survive that, especially after that beating? Plus, uh, you get that connection between the glowing knuckles, the moon metal knuckles, mm-hmm. and that laser, they're the same color or very, very similar. Uh, so, I yeah. so I thought, well, maybe that's, uh, that's uh, right. Rusty Drake um, suggesting that this is a, to Apollo, this is a murderous beam. This is the killing blow. Right. right. And maybe they could have just killed him originally that way, but first they wanted to humiliate him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that was a key component to Kid Vigilante's strategy here. He had to do it in that way right. in order to, to get the result he wants later. So I ended this issue not knowing if I liked Kid Vigilante. <laughs> <laughs> now, later in the series, I do like him again, but yeah. I felt a bit negative towards him here. Okay, so what? Yeah, so that that's basically we've gone over the plot and, and talked about some uh, key elements that we liked. Um, so, what were your general thoughts having ended that first issue? Maybe both uh, when you, if you can recall, when you first read it, as compared to rereading it again now recently. Well, 
I don't know. I think there was just a progressive taking away of my innocence as a reader, in a sense, ah. um, from the beginning, you know, the very innocent opening scene. And then we get the kids gathering together and, and each step along the way makes everything seem less innocent and more visceral and um, possibly unpleasant. But in a way that I also want to, I, I also have gotten all kinds of hints about this world and I want to know so much more because of it seeming so rich. So it's kind of this, for me, it was a weird just, juxtaposition of the sort of rich, delightful superhero world <laughs> and the gritty, unpleasant, um, violent world. Yeah. Uh, but it did it to me step by step. So it kept drawing me through. Yeah. Wow, that that's pretty much how I I uh, uh, that's the takeaway I had with about the book as well. I did I did in my notes here. So this is this is based on my reread. Um, I, I wrote down, "Wow, this is not Teen Titans. It's like Teen <laughs> Titans meets Powers in tone." Um, and then uh, I in, in some of the stuff that I read, uh, the, the comparison was made. I think by the writer of the article, it's Teen Titans meets Lord of the Flies. <laughs> Uh, which I, the first issue, definitely, I, I can see that comparison. What comes later, not, not, maybe not so much. Right. But, but definitely Teen Titans-esque uh, characters and situations maybe, um, but with a very adult uh, aesthetic right. applied to it. Uh, yeah, like it's I said, like they're giving us the Teen Titans and then taking them away. <laughs> yeah, subverting it. And again, yeah. So I, I, I think I have in my sto- uh, notes here how how things are subverted. So we get these familiar tropes of superhero, teen superheroes, but then they're inverted in a way, or in some ways that um, I think are kind of fresh. Uh, I, 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 I can't say that I've read every story out there uh, involving teen superheroes. Uh, but for all the ones that I have read, this is something new to me. This this take is it was new. Yeah, yeah. You definitely are not in familiar territory by the end of the book. Yeah. I want to know more because we we get these hints about the backstory, the history. Uh, we don't get them. It just makes me want to inhabit this world even more. Oh wait. Uh, so one of my notes, uh, one of my questions here that I wanted to ask you. Is this a commentary of the Copper Age, the 90s ultra-violent, grim and gritty comics that we got? I don't know. Is it a commentary on it? Or is it is it incorporating that particular aesthetic into a more modern comic? I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. If there's a commentary on it, I'm not sure what the commentary... I can see the commentary on all the older comics. Yeah. better than I can see it on the yeah on the dark age or I don't I, I don't know um yeah I uh, and I mean I think we still live in a pretty violent age of comics that's true <laughs> so I'm a little confused on that whole issue to yeah. do personally <laughs> yeah I yeah I like I said it it was just a question that popped in my brain I I, I ended up doing that quite a bit I I would uh based on what I was reading I would I would see maybe see these connections, but I wasn't quite sure if, if it was really making a connection or if it's just my brain misfiring and going right. off into a direction that does not, it's not uh, pertinent to the particular story, but. I mean, I'll, did you feel there was kind of a commentary here? I don't know. I, I think you're, I think you're more right in the sense that superhero comics in general, these days are just more violent than they used to be. You know, there, there's the whole relaxing of the comics code or the abandonment of the comics code. So that that tend, I think that tends toward that kind of storytelling anyway. The the, the writers and, and artists are creating their craft for a more adult audience than perhaps was done in years past. So right. that makes sense that they're doing it. That they're telling more adult stories. I, yeah, I don't know. I probably not a commentary is just a reflection or, or at least a, a, um, uh, continuation of that, which has mm-hmm. come before. I mean, it could be that the creators are saying, well, if you want violence, let's put it into a context 
where it's really violent and disturbing. Well, okay. So in that sense, that is sort of a commentary, I guess, on that. If if that's what they're doing. I mean, yeah, I just exactly. pulled that out of my hat right now because I mm-hmm. didn't think of it before. But mm-hmm. um, I can see that, though. That makes total sense. Because it d- is more disturbing with people, you know, if the characters are between 12 and 16 rather than <laughs> older characters. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Well, I think we talked issue one to death. <laughs> I know. I, I'm looking at the clock and thinking, yes, if we take 40 minutes per issue, we're in trouble. Right? Yeah. So I think uh, we will, uh, if you don't mind, we will we'll touch on what we need to touch on, but maybe do a, do a quicker uh, read through of each issue. Mm-hmm. Sure, of course. <laughs> but but I but I I did I just like in my notes, I took I took like three pages of notes on that first issue, and then for every other issue, it's it's about a page and a half to two pages. Uh, uh, because there's there's just so much to be introduced to and talk about based on that first issue. So now that we've done that, we can we can gloss over some things and really focus in on the important stuff of each issue. Uh, so issue number two, and I'll show the the cover there, which is a a different. Oh, let me let me do the comparison here. So you have you had that first that first issue cover. Right. With the fist, so there, Damien. There we go. There again. There's that focus Purple. on on the fist and and yeah, the colors, fist. and you have the, the characters there. So that I think this. Oh, we need to talk about something else real quick before we move on too. You got you got the this. I think effectively establishes the tone of the book. Maybe not into the the uh, the really dark territory that we do get, but you certainly get a sense of there's a battle that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, going on here. The first cover is pretty grim. Is that yeah. what you're kind yeah, of yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's a better, Especially thank you. In contrast to the second cover. Yeah, exactly. So then you get your shimmy on the cover there with some uh, Japanese text. Yeah, there's, I mean, th- she's being fired on, but the but the the colors, comp- uh, the color palette is is much brighter and lighter than, than the issue number one. So that was an interesting right. choice. It looks and- more like the fun, safe world of comics. Yes, exactly. Might- traditionally expect and and you're focusing in on one character and while indeed that does occur in this issue uh it's not just that so i thought that was an interesting interesting choice to be made as far as what's shown on the cover here but before we get into that let's talk about the logo danger club which of course evokes the whole fight club thing that that movie that book right I don't know if there's much to say about it. Other than that, I, I will admit that when I went through uh, first reading this this story, I didn't pick up on the whole Fight Club connection. Even after I know I saw that movie, I saw it years ago. I'm sorry, I'm missing it now. Is the logo similar to the Fight Club logo? Yeah, yeah. There, there are connections there. Uh-huh. I've, the I don't logos. remember the Fight Club logo, so uh-huh. especially the club part. The uh huh. Because in the Fight Club, it's it's that it's the, those words cut into that into that bar of soap. Uh huh. So it's evocative of that, right? And, and considering the the violent nature uh, of the of the one part of that story, the Fight Club story, um, compare that to the violent nature of this book. You know, so there's that tenuous right. connection at least. Um, but I thought it was I thought it was you, Damien, that had pointed out something about Fight Club and Danger Club, and that. That's what got me thinking about it. It must. Do you, I don't think it was me. Okay. Well, maybe I thought it was you, but maybe I maybe I, I saw somebody else talking about it. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, just mention that that aspect of it. And and there is in some of the interviews that I read there there they do talk about that just just a tiny bit. They do mention that at least. Uh huh. Okay. So uh, let's move it quickly into issue number two. Uh, here's the synopsis: Kid Vigilante. Oh. Yeah, spoilers. There's there's a spoiler here, sort of, um, <laughs> but you can't miss it. It's it's right up front. Kid Vigilante is is shown as being captured, and Jack shoots him in the head. Uh, flashing Jack is his uh, partner in, in yes his team. Yes, uh, uh, flashing back. Kid Vigilante takes Ladybug. We'll talk about her more later. To his HQ to retrieve some information. Robot Nine goes to micro Tokyo to retrieve something. That's pretty much what happens in this issue. Okay. Damien, do you want to go ahead and read that, that, uh, that blurb on the inside cover for this issue? Um, 
The world was ending. With the heroes gone, there was no one willing to stand against the coming darkness except us. We were the sidekicks, adopted, appointed, or recruited. Nephews, daughters, cousins, children. We weren't ready. And the world wasn't ready to trust us with the power we had. So who do you think is, is narrating the, these uh, introductions? I've got to feel it was Kid Vigilante, but what do you think? Well, that's that think? to me, that's the obvious choice, right? But the way... The way that, you know, that we weren't ready and the world wasn't ready to trust us. I don't know, just that we weren't ready. That seems to be counter to the confident kid vigilante that we've been shown so far. So it made me question that a little bit. But logically, who really, who really could that be? It seems like it has to be kid vigilante. I suppose it could be Jack. Um who goes through many turns in our understanding of who he is and what he's up to. That, that, that's a, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I kind of like that. And he's kind of the old young one. Um, yes. But again, I guess that's not brought up in this issue, but so we get another, um, very light silver age ladybug meeting kid vigilante and, and uh, or I guess Ladybug is the Insectra's sidekick. And, and we see now that Kid Vigilante also worked with someone named Kid Victory, and they both would like to date her, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plus the nine hero machines micro in micro to- of Micro Tokyo and their professor creator and their creator, Professor Takumi Onomato. I don't yes. know if we ever hear about him again. If we do, I, I missed it. I, I I did I did look for that. I think this is the only reference to him. But you do see Robot Nine there. Right. So there's the, yeah there's this whole story of these robots that we don't get. Right. Um, and then of course uh, just on that 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 first page. Interesting. We a super. How many? How often do we see a supervillain with with a sidekick? I, I really like that quality of, of this. Right. Of this story. It's not often. I mean, you you get you get super villains partnering together, working together. But rarely do you see a supervillain with it with a sidekick. So that right. was cool. But in this world, I think most of the supervillains had sidekicks too. Probably, yeah. What an interesting world. Uh, and yeah, it's you're right. Such a fun light picture, and then we turn the page to the most yes. hideous looking picture of. Oh it. my gosh! Two okay, so, man wearing a mask. <laughs> yes. So, I, I, hold, Damon, hold that up um, again, if you don't mind. Yeah. So the trick with YouTube is whoever's talking is the one whose image is actually showing to the audience. Right. So uh, that's why I talk when I hold things up. So pardon me. Um, But yeah, so we get this. um, We eventually learn he's the American spirit. I don't know if we learn right away. Um, So I think he's like a Captain America who's aged naturally and become the president of the United States. Well, not only that, but I think so. Yeah, he says he says the president, the first president of the global United States. Oh, interesting. I missed that. Yeah, whatever that means. Right. But again, so notice you got other hints that it's not like our United States. Right. Of course. But yeah, yeah I, I obviously he, he looks like a, um, a uh, Captain America type um, uh, character. Right. Uh, again, notice, though, I, you know, I talked about the, the close ups of, of, of fists and, and arms and stuff like that. You get you get that first page uh, showing this the guy who ends up being called American Spirit. You get that close up of his mouth, uh, you know he's missing a, missing a tooth, and but then it it, it again close at the bottom it close ups on his face, and you get, again you get that those those big masks that right. Jones likes to draw on characters. Anyway, but he's talking about basically. I think he's addressing. I don't know. I, I don't know who he's addressing here, but he's essentially he says my fellow Americans. That's, that's so I was true. wondering if it was televised, right? But. But then in that, that second page, he's shown there in his wheelchair with the guard behind him. And, and I'm not, I wasn't sure if he was, he was talking to, to, uh, directly. yeah, it, it's kind of weird in that sense, but, but I, you know, the, I'm, you can assume that there's, there's maybe a, a, a camera in front of him that we're not seeing, but yeah, he talks about how, what kid vigilante does is a terrorist act and, and they can't abide that. And then you get that shocking second, uh, third page 
reveal of of Jack right. going up and shooting Kid Vigilante in the head. I mean, God, how that is just so brutal. Right. In the first issue, we were led up slowly into the brutality. In the second issue, we're slapped in the face with it. Sort exactly. Of right the beginning. That is, and I mean, you see, God, you see, it looks like brain matter being splattered outside the back of his head. I know. It's oh. It's painful it's a little to look more at. real than we're used to seeing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, anything else about those pages, Damien? Not without talking about future issues, really. Yeah. So let's. Yeah. We'll, so we'll, then we flash back, and we don't come back to that scene for this issue. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, I think maybe this is the first time that we see Jack Fearless's robot arms. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Because I don't think we, I think we saw him. Uh, he had a jacket on or something in the previous issue, but now he's got these these robot arms, and that does we we find out more about that. Um, I believe the modern day Bucky, you know, the revived Bucky, of has course, a robot the Winter arm. Soldier. Yeah, right. I I completely forgot about that. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's even more of a direct connection, isn't it? Yeah. It's like it's like so. Jack Freelis is is kind of like a. a uh, a, uh, a mashup between Nick Fury and uh, and Bucky. Bucky, very much. The what, two, a, what a uh, weird combination. Yeah. Well, and I don't know, I I don't know about current Captain America, but when I used to read him a lot as a kid, he was always teaming up with Nick Fury. Okay, see, I'm not so, I'm not all so that familiar that with the history. Why they mashed the two together in their brain? Mm. Bucky was not around in the '70s and early '80s Captain America, but Nick Fury was there all the time. And okay. they were always squabbling with each other. Nick Fury always thought that Captain America was trying to steal his dame. <laughs> his girlfriend. <laughs> who was always called uh, a dame. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, so that is a period of, or, or a, a set of comics that I am woefully lack, lacking uh-huh. in having read. So it sounds like I need to go find some back issues. Well, there's a very interesting Steve Englehart run in the mid-'70s Captain America that I would think is worth looking for. Oh, but. wait. Englehart did did that. I I definitely got to pick that up. I love Englehart's Batman, so that makes total sense. <laughs> anyway, okay. we're, we're digressing. Quite yes, a bit. we are just a little bit. Uh, okay, then so we, we go to the mansion in the next page where it says earlier, and this is where I real. I mean, I suspected that Kid Vigilante was a Robin substitute, but now it's extremely clear because they're going down into the basement of the mansion where there's a robot dinosaur and other gear that is vaguely or quite specifically just like Batman stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 that particular panel um, you have, they, they show this plane, this polka dotted plane hanging from above. And you got that, that uh, uh, robot dino in the, in the background there. So yeah, it's, it's the bat cave. Uh, even, even that, that plane, I, 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 uh, I remember seeing pictures of the bat cave where a bat plane was hanging from, from above. So Totally right. evocative of of the Batcave, so I, I really like that. Everything but the giant penny. Yes, yes. Although, wait do... a minute. Then in profile. Oh, yep. There you go. There's a what might be a giant penny there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you so turn the. It pay- definitely pays to be an inexperienced comic book reader to read this. Well, at, not that the... you wouldn't enjoy it without, but it definitely exactly. Pays but but off. it. It's like all of the the uh, the Easter eggs, if you will, in right. in, in the comic book movies, uh, based movies, and and the television shows. Uh, you just you, you get another layer of enjoyment if you know those things. Whereas you know if you're if you're coming into this new, it's, you know you see a guy and a, this girl walking in into this uh, technologically or, or, or a place that has all this technology in it, and some of it looks kind of weird. A robot dino, what? Yeah, and then. Already, just with that fun reminder of silver, silver and even golden age Batman, uh, but then they just look so grim, you know. And then you turn the page, and it's definitely nothing you would see in the silver or golden age Batman. Okay, and you're referring to the this shot of someone who looks just like him, yes, uh, in yeah. a tank, and we and, and he calls him brother. So brother, hello brother, right? So uh, we presume that's Kid Victory. That referenced on the right, first thing because we've seen Kid Victory now, and so and that's an interesting twist on Batman to imagine him having twin, uh, twin sidekicks. Yes, although I I will admit that I thought possibly that this was 
a clone of Kid Vigilante. Uh huh. He just, he just kind of calls him that his clone brother. That's true. Uh, they could be, but they, they don't. They, there's nothing directly about that. Oh yeah. And we currently have the whole idea that Bat from uh, Scott Snyder that Batman's going to clone himself in the future and give himself traumatic memories to keep turning his clones into Batman. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, so now we get into, so now we are what? This is two, three, four, five, six, five. seven pages into the story. And we, we, we join Yoshimi in micro Tokyo. So even though she's featured on the cover, it's seven pages in and we finally get to her story. Right. So that, I thought that was, again, that's why I, I talked about her on um, being on the cover as an inter- interesting choice comparatively to the other, other issue. But otherwise, uh, uh, Micro Tokyo, uh, flying cars, so it's technologically advanced. Uh, they're, they're threatening her uh, to the point of they will kill her if she doesn't basically surrender. And, right. and, and she's confidently flying into this, this place to get whatever it is that she's, she's right. after. Well, and they say loss of citizenship will result in termination. Yes. Which implies a very dystopian place, even though at first it looks very appealing, because if you're not a citizen, they kill you. Yeah, good point. It's very utopian looking society. And, uh, the, the, the politics here probably aren't as inviting. Right. There's a lot of brutality <laughs> holding together this society. Even in micro Tokyo. Uh, she, she flies somewhere and she gets attacked. And so there's that panel, Damien, that uh, at the bottom of one page, you got that blue hand, but it, uh, this is just me, my, my neurons misfiring, but it reminded me of, of um, uh, Blue Beetle's bug for some reason. Yeah, I thought some kind of robot bug was attaching her when I first looked yeah. at the picture. But, but you do see on the next page that yeah. that's just the hand yeah. of, right. of these two giant robots, which are not the same kind of robots that Yoshimi drives. True. Um, in fact, they have the infinity symbol on, on their, on their chests. Right. So maybe and, there was an old robot team that was called, what do they say at the beginning? Uh, nine hero machines. Yes. But now they've replaced it with something else, maybe more that says infinity on it. And is perhaps more fascistic. Or, mm-hmm. And then the design that you compare the design between these newer robots and, right. and the robot nine style. And you can definitely see uh, a transition from older tech to newer tech. So that's, you know, kind of neat right. just, just from a visual standpoint. That's true. I hadn't thought about that, but that really indicates change there. So, and then we get the intercutting of kid vigilante with his brother talking to his brother's lifeless body in the tank. Oh, and he said he uh, kid vigilante d- does say we're not ready. And so that kind of echoes the beginning the front piece. Yeah. We right. weren't ready. So maybe, right. okay. I'm, I'm going to officially say uh, here and now that's kid vigilante and we won't uh, consider anybody else for, the, for that text. <laughs> Even though we may consider this a potential hidden masterpiece, it doesn't mean that everything's perfect about it. Right. That's true. So there may be a little inconsistency in Kid Vigilante's personality (laughs) where he does have doubts. (laughs) Yeah, and and that is that we get that a lot in this issue, which is we'll we'll come to specifics of that. And then so yeah, now we're now we're transitioning each I don't know if you noticed this, but each page, alternating pages are focused on uh, Kid Vigilante with his brother and then what's happening with your shimmy. And that goes on for a few pages. Um, but returns to it again as we go on. So it's interesting the way that that uh, Jones designed these pages coming up. Right. Um, it's kind it, of a fluctuating intensity as then we go into a double page battle with your shimmy, right. and then we get a double page sort of emotional gut punch with Kid Vigilante. Yes. Breaking yes. down and crying and yeah. taking off his mask even. Yes where we see his bruised face as he's crying. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I, I, I'm glad you, you mentioned that. I really wanted to touch on that scene too, when we get to that. Uh, I'll, I'll mention one thing about the, uh, the, the micro Tokyo scene. Um, not only is it potentially life threatening to, in, in Yoshimi's case, but um, one of the, one of the characters in the, the newer robot says, you are a fool Yoshimi. 
No woman may pilot the, the gigantobots. The right, that right is held by men alone. So yeah. you, get, you get this extremely sexist attitude here uh, from these characters. Right. And it does make me admire her all the more that she stands up to that. Yes. Yeah. She says, men, I see no men here. Just little boys playing soldier. Right. Raw recruits who think they know what it takes to be a pilot. Now I order you to stand down, stand down, stand down or face the consequences. I just love the the bravado of this character. She's She uh-huh. is... Uh, not going to take their guff and uh, she's going to uh, let them have it. If they don't, if they're not smart enough to recognize they're, they're better. Right. So this is kind of, I mean, it's really good, but it's more traditional comic book stuff in a way where we've got a plucky hero beating the odds mm. and taking down people, you know, who, and she doesn't kill them or anything, but um people who establish themselves as being deserving of being taken down a, bit, a notch <laughs> yes. or three. <laughs> yes, exactly. On the next page, it's, it's, uh, it's just three panels, but you get, a you get almost a, a, a two page splash, but I love, I love what she's like. She's like, you know what this is? It's remote control bitches. And then her <laughs> robot shows up. Which I'm sure is a direct translation from Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I and she it. says that line in some later issue, right? So that's, an important line, remote control bitches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the next two pages. And so, uh, like I said, I'm Damien, I'm going to try to go this through this quickly. So if we're skipping over anything, uh, no, no, I was the one rushing ahead. So keep going. Yeah. But, but, but feel free to jump back if, if we need okay. to, uh, the next two pages are what you mentioned these already. Uh, this is a, a very emotional scene, a very intimate scene between ladybug and, and, uh, kid vigilante. He's talking to his brother. He uh, vigilante, vigilante explains to Ladybug that he's in there not because of you know some scheme by a supervillain. He's he, you know he was uh, defeated in battle or anything. It was a neurological disorder, and they're I assume so. He he mentions Red Vengeance, so that's their their mentor. I assume that's their father as well. Right. I had assumed the guy's name was Vigilante until that moment. And then I forgot about it. Right. Right. So you have Vengeance, Vigilante, and Victory. So you got that whole alliterative thing. Put him in stasis and wired him into the computers. He's not dead, but he's not. And then, you know, dot, dot, dot. He's not alive is what he's referring to. And then Vigilante breaks down. You see him in a very vulnerable moment which up to this point is really ta- really took me back uh, took me aback cuz cuz he's shown such confidence uh in everything that we've seen him in uh so far and uh you know ladybug puts puts her hand on his shoulder he reciprocates and then turns to her and you mentioned the the the, the black eye you get that scene there where he just looks at her he's got that that huge black eye he's crying and sa- and tells him tells her his name andrew my name is andrew and you see with the mask removed you see his pupils you see his eyes for the first time i think so again yeah. you know the, the eyes looks being, even younger with his mask removed i would exactly, say exactly yeah yeah you know the, that 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 old uh, what's that old saying you know the eyes are the windows to the soul and right. you get you get the a very human moment with uh, with this character between these characters that we don't see when he wears the mask. So I thought that was just an interesting um, uh, contrast. Yeah, yeah. This, I mean, this is kind of the pivotal pivotal scene of the issue, really. I guess it then gets broken up from the robot fight, and then we come back to it. Yeah, or Would no, like- we don't come back to it till the following. Or- oh, okay, yeah. It is the pivotal scene. It is, yeah. We don't fully realize what has just happened until a few pages later. Right. So uh, Vigilante does take something out of the device of his that that tube, that stasis tube from his brother. Right. And more importantly, you know, uh, Vigilante says, goodbye, brother. When he pulls that out, and it looks sort of like a USB stick, you know, a sort of futuristic looking v- a USB stick. You see a spark of, of power there. And the lights go out 
And during the course of the, this, these scenes with Vigilante, at the top and bottom of the pages, uh, there's, there's, you see this heartbeat monitor going along. And as soon as he pulls that out, the lights go dim that you don't see the heartbeat. It just goes flat as it goes across the page. So did he just kill his brother? Yeah. I wasn't sure then, but I thought maybe that's what, you know, cause it does, I guess it's flatlined there, but I wasn't sure when I first read it, if that's well, what it, it is kind of hard to see because of the way that they draw the the other heartbeats right. going through. But but the flat lines in all the other pages are definitely shorter than the one that they show right. on that final that final scene. Right. But I wish, yeah. And I realize later that is what happens. But um... but again, how how dire is the situation right. that they're in? That that vigilante feels like he, in order to accomplish what he thinks he needs to accomplish he has to murder his his dying but not yet dead brother right uh, a form of euthanasia did you feel sure at this point that he really had to do it uh i i felt that he felt he was sure he needed to do it yeah. <laughs> uh from I think from there was still a little part of me from the last issue that wondered if there was some other reason that was less admirable why he was pulling the plug on his brother. But considering how, you know, in that first issue, he talks about how his superpower is he's always right. I, right. you know, I, I just, I guess I kind of just accepted it that this is the thing that needs to happen. Right. Um, well, as much as later, I didn't I like it. Accept it once we learned, you know, what it was. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we get the next two pages are just more battle scene. What, what do you think of the, 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 uh, the structure, the the narrative of the of this 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 two page spread of the battle scene. Did you, because you commented on that earlier with the fight between Apollo and Vigilante? What about the right. scene here? I, well, I like the layouts. Um, I mean, given that I'm kind of a wimp about violence, it's nice when robots are beating each other up. Rather than humans. <laughs> but, but uh, uh, you know, he conveys the action really well. I, I guess I don't have a lot. I, I maybe. Maybe your thing about a lot of uh, limbs is still like there's even a fist that goes right through another robot. Um, it does seem to, I think the purpose of this is to show us that her older robot is better than their new ones. Yes. At least when piloted by her. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's probably key. It's not that the, necessarily that the technology is, is any better because it's right. older in some way. It's definitely because of her. Yeah. These guys are no match for this girl. Yeah, even though they were they have infinity robots and hers is just number nine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh I, I just like that too. I, I I love I love stories that feature female characters um shown as better than than the male counterparts. Uh, I, I just uh, uh this, your wife points that out to you every now and then. <laughs> I I I'll, I'm gonna delve just briefly into into my personal history. Uh, if you don't mind, um, I, my, my parents split up when I was young, I, I was, I lived with my mom. So I, I saw this woman hold a family together, get multiple jobs to keep food on the table, to pay the bills. So I am, I am intrinsically drawn to, to, uh, characters portrayed, uh, female characters portrayed in, in, in such a positive and, um, um, a positive light in, in the way that the. Yoshimi is shown here as being strong, independent, and uh, kicking butt. You know, she's not to be trifled with. So I, I, I appreciate that in, in fiction as well. Right. Well, that's a very powerful piece of information. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I don't have that situation, and I more respond to the giant robots fighting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, too. I, 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 I like that, too. There were no robots, and each one had a different number on it. And the higher the number, the more powerful the robot. <laughs> But See, then the robot who was just had number five on it would have to beat the robot that had a number 10 on it or something. Like that. <laughs> See, th there's so much, so many more <laughs> stories that could be told in this universe. I think we need to petition uh, Mr. Walker, uh, Jones and Drake to do more. Right. In that um, podcast we both listened to, they did mention that there could be more, but not in the first. The, yeah. Not in the near future because they, they need a rest from it all. 
Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, so we get the next two pages. The battle is over. Uh, she she says, "That's uh, she says idiots. That's what you are, childish idiots." Next time, I will not be so merciful. <laughs> right. And then she flies away, and we see Micro Tokyo from above. And this, so this does not look like Japan. This is just uh, this is an island somewhere in the ocean, and you see this sprawling city. So even though it's micro, we know it's Micro Tokyo. We, I still don't get a sense of what that means based on this picture. And I'll just briefly show that for the video viewing people here. So you get this island, but we don't know how big it really is because it's, it's, it's not, we don't see a sense of scale here. But we do see that the, the city um, fills up that island. Right. It fills up an island, which I assume is a fairly small one. And it has a, some kind of energy dome over it that she breaks through. Yeah. And then uh, magician helps her escape that that energy well, dome. creates one of those gateways that she yeah. can pop through. Yeah. So uh, mission accomplished. No worries. Now someone get me a beer large enough for me to climb into. <laughs> Again, we get we get more of the personality of Yoshimi, and, and the more I read about her, the more I love this character. But folks at home, kid, twelve year old kids should not be given <laughs> beer to swim in. <laughs> yes, my comments are not to be taken as. Uh, as being accepting of underage drinking. There's our, there's our PSA. <laughs> uh, and then the final page, um, we find out that, okay, so uh, Kid Vigilante actually says the module, whatever that thing was, I took from my brother's stasis tube. Oh yeah, there we go. So I, I was right, it's a stasis tube. Held a remote backup of my dad's memories. And then uh, sh- he shows her something that and says, this is the last thing he saw. And she says, but that's dot, dot, dot. And he says, yes, but then, okay, now we get ready for war. What the heck did, 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 did he show her? I know. Do we ever find out? I don't feel like we do. I, I you know, I, I, I would have agreed with you until you just said that I just made a connection. I think, I think uh-huh. something coming up in a future issue that we see that we did not see any time previous, maybe that thing. But uh-huh. we'll, we'll have to okay. take a t- closer look to it. At, at, and then I'm wondering, did their his dad set things up so that the copy of his memory is tied to the life of the other boy? Yeah. And you can't access his memory without killing his son. Well, yeah, I mean, which... I don't know why. Just another kind of sick little detail or something. No, I had, I had exactly the same thought. And it just makes that scene even more heart-wrenching. And I'm going to stop it right there. Damien and I talked a lot about the first four issues of Danger Club, so I wanted to break that conversation into two parts. So please come back and listen to part two, where we discuss issues three and four of this great series. If you'd like to leave feedback about this episode, or if you have questions for us about Danger Club, you can always email me at longboxreview at gmail.com or via Twitter at Longbox Review, or at the website, longboxreview.com. Thanks for listening.